Hey, oh, hello. Welcome everyone to a brand new video. This started out as a writing exercise for myself, but I thought it would be fun enough to share. On today's What If, we will be building a Dragon Ball story based around and in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Basically, what if Marvel had gotten the rights to Dragon Ball back in 2007? and were tasked with integrating it into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This would, of course, change the rest of the Cinematic Universe. In adapting Dragon Ball, we'd also have to change various things about the story itself, but I'll try to keep the spirit of both Dragon Ball and Marvel, as well as having various cameos and easter eggs and stuff like that, just like any other Marvel movie. Also, the power levels and universe of Dragon Ball have been toned down, so it can be set in a more realistic world, like the rest of the Marvel Universe. I tried to keep all of the other movies intact, but I decided to do something a bit different with the reality stone. So, for phase 2, I will have to cut out Thor The Dark World. Maybe then we could have gotten a good Thor movie? Anyways, let's begin. We open the story with a starry sky, where a ship crashes onto Earth, next to a small house. Out comes an old man, and hears a cry of a young boy. He goes to pick him up, just to see a tail drop. They both laugh, and we cut to the Marvel logo. When we open up again, we see it's 17 years later, at a place called Capsule Corp, a subsidiary of Stark Enterprises in Japan. Boma just finished up a call with Tony Stark, an old friend, about sending over more Hoi Poi capsules to store Iron Man suits in. Their parents had worked together in the Super Soldier Project during World War II. Boma's parents had lived in the United States at that time and helped the US government. Dr. Briefs and his wife had met there, so Boma is half American. She tells Tony that she's going on a vacation for a while. She winks as she says that. She then hangs up the phone and takes the Dragon Radar and a Dragon Ball, which are a bit more red than the ones we know. She had been tasked by S.H.I.E.L.D. to travel through the world and find these relics called the Dragon Balls. After S.H.I.E.L.D. found one stored in ice, along with Captain America, we then see Goku in Mount Poutsu, training by himself. His tail is very obvious. He was around 16, 17 years old, living by himself. We see then that Boma is at the foot of the mountain, asking people around about the Dragon Balls. But all she gets are warnings about a monster that lives on top of the mountain. She decides to go anyways. But once there, she gets attacked by a pterodactyl. She thinks this is the monster they are talking about. But Goku saves her with a power pull. She shoots at him when she notices the tail. But Goku is okay. She profusely apologizes when she realizes it's just a kid. They introduce themselves and Bulma tells Goku that she is looking for the Dragon Balls. She then freaks out a little when Goku shows her his. Goku claims that it's his grandpa's treasure and he can't just give it out. But she tells him that they can grant any wish and he could even maybe have it eventually. She also tells him that he'd be able to see the world and learn. Bulma is older and she's worried about him being all alone. So finally, he agrees, excited to go on an adventure. We then see a dark room where a team of two, a woman and a short man, along with their dog, are afraid. As they reach over for a Dragon Ball that's in a tomb in South America, they then turn around and hand it over to a dark figure, who they call Piccolo. The team then runs away. Let them go, we have what we need. One down, six to go. Then cut back to Goku and Boma in Russia, where they find a Dragon Ball after helping a village that had been terrorized by a monster that transforms. They find out that the monster is no monster at all, just a boar that the people were afraid of at night. They then go to eat at a restaurant. They are having a conversation, and Goku explains how excited he was to travel on a plane for the first time. Goku also tells Boma that he used to have a grandfather but he is now dead. Suddenly, the two get attacked by monsters, some winged, some not, all of them green. Boma shoots some of them down while Goku saves people and takes others down. They realize that they were trying to get the Dragon Balls they have. Boma grabs one by the neck as she points her gun at it and asks who the hell they are. The monster doesn't respond, instead, it dies, and Boma sees a dark figure walk through the door and next to him, a small green child. The figure uses some kind of power to bring Boma towards him. Goku goes to attack, but the green child attacks him in return, pushing him back. This gives Boma time to use her capsule, so both Goku and her escape. Piccolo tells the child to let them go. Come back, Junior. We will follow them. Goku asks what the hell that was, 
and Momo says she doesn't know, but knows of somebody who might know answers. An old friend of her dad. They head out to Hawaii and land on a small island. There is a bald kid training, along with an old bald man. They are both very confused. Bulma smiles as she gets off and calls him Master Roshi. Roshi asks how Dr. Briefs is. Bulma tells Goku to stay outside while Roshi and her talk business. Roshi is serious and tells her that he doesn't want anything to do with S.H.I.E.L.D. Bulma says it's not about that though she will need the Dragon Ball that she knows he has. She mostly needs Roshi to train Goku. Roshi refuses, as he already has Krillin to train. Suddenly, they both hear a boom outside. They go look and realize that Goku and Krillin had been fighting, and they both just clashed fists. Roshi sighs, but still refuses, though he recognizes Goku's power. Boma then tells Roshi about the monster that attacked. Roshi gets worried, and agrees that at the very least, Goku will be safer with him. Roshi tells them all about a story from long ago, about an evil demon king that tried to take over Earth. He was released during World War II, but sealed away quickly once again. His name was Piccolo, and it seemed like someone had unsealed him. He isn't sure who it was, but the only people who really knew about him were either dead or part of S.H.I.E.L.D. Roshi now trusts S.H.I.E.L.D. even less, but Boma says it couldn't have been then. Roshi decides to trust Boma, at least for now. Boma tells Goku that he will have to stay with Roshi while she keeps looking for the Dragon Balls. Right now, she has four, including the one that Roshi gave her. She has the signal of two more, but one is mysteriously absent from the radar. Goku is sad and tells her no, but she has to leave anyways. Goku feels a little betrayed. Bulma promised to return when she had the rest, but Goku and Krillin become good friends and begin to train together. Time passes, and one day Roshi and the boys go to the main island for some food. There, they go to a shop at the foot of a volcano. The volcano is called Fire Mountain, and Roshi is greeted by a girl named Chi-Chi, who instantly falls in love with Goku. Roshi asks how the Ox King is doing, named that for the great meats he sells. Goku is excited to eat, and the Ox King greets them. The Ox King then realizes the power pool and asks if he knows Gohan. Roshi notices it too, and is happy to hear that it was his grandpa, but both are sad to hear that he has passed away. We then cut to Boma trying to find the next Dragon Ball in a cave. However, it's a trap, and Piccolo welcomes her. Boma is captured, and now Piccolo has five of the Dragon Balls. After some more training, Goku is hanging out at the meat shop again. He's taken a liking to the food, and also Chi-Chi. Suddenly, him and Chi-Chi hear an explosion. The volcano is erupting. Goku and Chi-Chi run out to get Roshi, who was setting up the boat. Krillin and him run with Goku to the volcano. They gotta do something. Roshi tells them to stand back as he bulks up. Kamehameha! He fires, destroying part of the volcano and stopping the lava. Everyone is glad, but suddenly it starts up back up again. Roshi doesn't know if he has enough power to pull off a stronger Kamehameha, but Goku looks at his hands, then towards the volcano, and finally towards the shop. He knows he can do it. Goku cups his hands and fires a Kamehameha at the volcano, stopping it for good. Everyone celebrates, but something catches Krillin's eye. He goes to get it. Solidified along with the lava was one of the Dragon Balls. Goku realized that the Dragon Radar must not have picked it up because there were several layers deep underground. Goku tells Roshi they gotta contact Boma about it. When they head back to Kame House, Roshi sees that he has a message, a distress signal from Boma. All it had was coordinates to the final Dragon Ball. Roshi tells Goku and Krillin to come along, and they all head out to the final Dragon Ball. Roshi clicks away the plane that they had traveled in. They had just landed in Africa. They look for the final Dragon Ball, but finally hear Piccolo say, Looking for this? He not only has almost every Dragon Ball, but also Bulma. He tells Goku to hand over the final Dragon Ball, or Bulma dies. He doesn't know what to do. Roshi and Krillin heads towards two different sides of Piccolo, while Goku uses the power pool to extend it out to Bulma. She grabs onto it, while Roshi fires at Kamehameha at Piccolo. They save Bulma, but now Piccolo releases his men. The young one, who he also calls Piccolo, attacks Goku. They have a long battle as Piccolo battles Roshi, and Krillin battles some of Piccolo's men along with Bulma. Roshi had brought a gun for Bulma, and she is using it. The battle stops dead in its tracks, when Piccolo punches Roshi non-stop until he dies. Goku and Krillin cry out to the sky as they hold their master. Goku stops. He was staring straight at a full moon. Goku transforms into an Ozaru, and everyone tries to get away, 
However, Piccolo stuck fighting the monkey as he almost gets stepped on. Meanwhile, Piccolo Jr. dives in to get the Dragon Ball that Goku had dropped as he transformed. He runs as far away as possible with the Dragon Balls and summons the dragon. Shenron is formed from a red, semi-solid element. Piccolo Jr. asks for his father to be returned to youth, and the wish is granted. The Dragon Ball spread once again, just as Krillin punches Piccolo Jr. across the jaw, knocking him out. King Piccolo is now stronger than ever, and even the Ozaru is having troubles. They know it could go bad, so Boma has to figure out what to do. She finally notices that the tail had perked up when he saw the moon, and every time Piccolo hit anywhere towards it, he would react. So that had to be the key. Krillin flies over to Boma and tells her of an idea he just had. Using one of the Hoi Poi capsules that held the helicopter, Boma and Krillin fly towards the Ozaru, cutting the tail off with the helicopter's blades. It nearly destroys the helicopter, but the tail is cut off, and Goku returns to normal. Boma and Krillin get away from the helicopter just as it explodes. Krillin laughs and comments on how he wants to get an attack just like that. However, now Piccolo is strong enough to kill them all. Goku is dazed, but finally wakes up. Krillin hands him something to put on as to not be naked. Piccolo is charging up a giant blast, but Goku and Krillin nod at each other. Though Krillin is frightful, he doesn't know if he will be able to do it. Goku fires a Kamehameha at Piccolo. The two blasts collide, and Krillin hesitates. Goku knows that he can't do it alone, so he pleads with Krillin to fire his own Kamehameha. Krillin finally does, and together, they blast away King Piccolo. Bulma is relieved, but afraid of how S.H.I.E.L.D. explained how she lost the Dragon Balls to S.H.I.E.L.D. He, she does take note, however, of how the dragon appeared from a red, gas-looking type of thing. Krillin then runs over to look for Piccolo Jr., but there's no sign of him. The three go back to Hawaii and mourn Roshi's death. The next scene is Goku, Krillin, and Bulma saying their goodbyes to each other. Krillin and Goku promise to meet up again for the tournament that will be held in a nearby island. Bulma takes Goku back to Mount Poutsu, where Goku sadly tells her that he finally realized something based on what Krillin and her told him. He must have been the one to have killed his grandpa many years ago. It's very sad, but Bulma tells him that it wasn't his fault, and that now he has a new family. They laugh together. Bulma makes Goku promise that someday, she will get to analyze that tail of his if he ever regrows it. The credits then roll, with Goku and Bulma running off to a new adventure. However, through the credits, we get also some different scenes of a world tournament. Chi-Chi is there, and a man with three eyes. Goku and Krillin smile at each other as they step onto the stage, but a white cape covers the camera, and we see that Piccolo Jr. is there, with his arms crossed. The credits end, and we get a post credit scene. Here, we see Goku training alone at night, right next to the place that says it's the World Martial Arts Tournament Stadium. Seemingly the night before the tournament matchup, Goku turns around and sees Boma leaning on a wall. She steps towards him and tells him that they weren't looking for the Dragon Balls just for fun. She needed to study them for a bigger threat. Goku was taken aback, but then he hears the voice of another man. The voice says, There aren't many people like you in the world. Like us, rather. My name's Tony Stark. Take a look at this. He hands Goku a folder with the word Avengers Initiative. The world needs people like you to save it from other, bigger green men. Referring to the Hulk attack from not too long ago. Bulma and Tony then walk out of sight, and Goku's left alone staring at the folder. Then the screen fades to black. And that's how the first Dragon Ball movie in the MCU ends. As you can see, I changed a lot of things to make the adaptation more similar to how the MCU has adapted its own comic series. Some easter eggs here and there, Gohan would have probably been played by Stan Lee for the one or two scenes is in. The power is of course scaled down, as I said, to match Phase 1 Marvel as well. And characters are aged up a little too. I didn't want to have a 12 year old getting punched around. Some connections between characters are made with S.H.I.E.L.D. and the such which I felt appropriate. The tournament is barely shown, but Marvel movies often skip through major events that are mentioned in later movies, so I thought it would be appropriate. Don't worry though, I have more stuff planned for it and its characters in the future in Phase 2. But for now, let's go to the Avengers. Hey kids, don't go away. We'll be right back. And now back to our show. I'm going to assume you guys have seen the other Marvel movies and the Avengers. As Natasha, As Natasha and the rest of the Avengers come together, Tony is tasked with getting Goku. 
he had already said no to the Avengers, similar to Tony. However, Tony was now going along with it because of the threat Earth seemed to be in. He looks for Goku but can't find him anywhere. Jarvis just keeps telling Tony to keep flying up until he finally gets above the clouds and sees a giant structure. He can't believe it, but he lands in it. Goku is there, meditating. Tony laughs, telling him to wake up. Goku asks what he's doing, as he already said no to the Avengers. Tony gets serious and tells him that Earth might actually be in danger. Do it for Roshi. Goku finally agrees. He tells Kami that he will be gone for a bit, and out steps a green man. Tony is scared that it's Piccolo, but Goku tells him that it's just God. Tony laughs it off, saying, Bye, green dude. It had been some time since we last saw Goku, and he now has some new skills on his sleeve, including flying. The power pole is also nowhere to be found. Once they get to the helicarrier, the Avengers meet each other. Goku is the youngest of them, at just around 16 to 18 years old, somewhere around there. He's obviously kind of dumb and uneducated, which annoys Tony, but the others find it a bit charming. As it turns out, Loki had taken the Tesseract, and they need to prepare to bring him back to justice. They are soon alerted to Loki being spotted in Germany. Captain America, Iron Man, and Goku all rush to the scene. Goku and Captain America take on Loki, admiring each other's fighting skills. Though Goku is stronger than Cap, after being dazed by a shield to the face, Loki is overpowered by Goku's Kamehameha and Iron Man's blast. The team is soon attacked by Thor, who wants to take Loki, but Goku bursts out the Quinjet, ready to battle the God of Thunder. It is a destructive scene, and Iron Man joins in, taking Thor to the ground, where Captain America intervenes between the three. Loki nearly escapes thanks to the altercation. Stark looks at Goku sternly, blaming him for the rash decision that almost cost them the prisoner. But Captain America points out that Tony is no much different. Plus, Loki's still their prisoner. At the helicarrier, an argument is started over S.H.I.E.L.D. using the Tesseract to create weapons. Goku is mostly silent, but he does know that it shouldn't be used for that purpose. Meanwhile, Hawkeye, who is under the control of Loki, begins to sabotage the helicarrier. This causes an explosion where Banner turns into the Hulk. Though Thor attempts to battle the monster, it isn't enough. Goku also attempts this. Goku's power is obviously incredible, though for fairness, I'd put him below Thor in this universe for now. It takes both the God of Thunder and Goku himself, working together to defeat the Hulk. The two heroes admire each other, thinking they were both really powerful. <laughs> You're a mighty adversary, Goku. In a different situation, I'd love to challenge you for fun. In the process of taking the Hulk down, Hulk is knocked out of the helicarrier and onto the ground below. Goku and Thor want to help him out, but the helicarrier is coming down fast. Goku flies out to attempt to hold up the helicarrier, while Captain America and Iron Man fix the turbines. Sadly, Loki escapes through the commotion and kills Agent Phil Coulson in the process. This motivates Goku to keep helping out the Avengers. Finally, the attack in New York starts, with Loki opening the portal from the top of Stark Tower. Chitari pour out of the portal. But not only that, other races of aliens attack as well. They all wear similar battle armor and scouters. The Avengers gather in a circle to confront the swarm of enemies, including the Hulk, who had caught up with them not long before. Everyone gets their own mission. Goku's is mostly to control the attack, while the others deactivate the portal. He does this through a various Kamehamehas up to the portal, destroying ships in the process. In the midst of the battle, we see some scenes of Loki talking to someone who is shrouded by darkness. They are both discussing their forces attacking Earth. One has a very distinct laugh. However, it's obvious that they are both working for somebody else. The Hulk and Goku make a destructive force together as they battle the enemies. A group of them that was coming for Goku get scared once they realize who he is and say, I, I didn't know there were Saiyans here, no one told us about that, before trying to escape. Goku was confused but paid little mind to it. He didn't know what a Saiyan was. When the Avengers realize that the missile may be the only way to stop the attack, Goku offers to be the one to take it up there. Tony realizes that Goku could probably do it, since he can clearly breathe where there is limited oxygen. However, he decides to be the one to do it, since he has extra protection thanks to the Iron Man suit. Tony achieves his goal, destroying the portal, and the team reunites as Goku crashes through Stark Tower, knocking Loki onto the ground. The Avengers then gather around Loki, arresting him. The team says their goodbyes, but they leave knowing they have a new team. The Avengers. And that 
is the end of Phase 1 with Dragon Ball. In the post credit scene, we see not only Thanos, but somebody else he's talking to. Somebody with a tail and horns. There are some questions left unanswered, but we open the movie with Goku and Krillin training together at Kami's lookout. Krillin is asking about the Avengers and the Battle of New York. It's all very exciting to him, and he hopes that he will get invited to the next Avengers mission. Goku tells him that he'll try his best to get him on. Then, the deep voice of Kami sounds throughout. He tells the two to calm down. It's time for more meditation. He tells them that spiritual training is just as important as physical training. Goku interjects and tells Kami that the World Martial Arts Tournament is coming up. They need to train. He doesn't want to hear it until two characters appear. Enter Ten Shin Han and Yamcha. These two characters had been in the previous tournament, though they were only seen in the credits of the previous movie. With some dialogue, we get to know them a little bit more. Yamcha wasn't a very well-known martial artist, but he was a very well-known baseball player. He was actually at the Battle of New York, helping out with some people on the ground. Meanwhile, Ten Shin Han is very secretive and reclusive. All they know about him is that he's incredibly powerful, and that he might not be exactly human. At least, they joke about it. The four break out into a another training session, and Kami has nothing to do but just watch them fight. The four enter the tournament, and we get a small montage of various fights, with some cameos such as Nam. Even Stan Lee makes an appearance, playing the tournament announcer. Boma and Chi Chi also appear, showing that they had been around as well. Goku and Boma hug with a bright smile and he notices that she's got the Dragon Raider with her. She says that she needs it to find the Dragon Balls, her shield. And she had detected one nearby. She tells Goku that she's already got three. Goku's happy to hear it. He then kisses Chi Chi on the cheek. It's time for the final battle between Goku and Ten Shin Han. Goku comments on how the battle was supposed to happen earlier, referring to the unseen tournament that we got glimpses of in the last film's credits. The battle begins, but we get cuts of Piccolo Jr. far away. He's approached by a man extremely fast. He asks who he is, just to be attacked. Such a powerful villain defeated already? The tournament is going well, when both Ten Shin Han and Goku feel like great power coming their way. Then, the whole stage is destroyed as three beings land. They look around, with a strange machine on their face. The middle one, with long hair, looks at Goku. He says, Ah, Kakarot! Why haven't the humans been killed yet? Goku is confused and asks what's going on. The man then realizes that Goku likes a tail. The shortest one is baffled, and he says, You dare to call yourself a Saiyan, yet you dress like them. You befriend them, and you lose your tail. Goku says he has no idea what a Saiyan is, but that he heard the word during the Battle of New York. The tallest one smirks, saying that one of the soldiers told them that a Saiyan had fought them. They didn't think he would be so weak, though. Goku turns to Krillin, who nods and takes Chi Chi and Bulma far away. Before he gets far, however, Piccolo blocks his path. They scream in fear, but Piccolo just ignores them as he closes in on the Saiyans before floating to Goku. The Saiyans call him a Namekian. Piccolo smirks and says that they both found out that they were aliens on the same day. Goku's still very confused, but realizes that Piccolo is missing an arm. He deduces that it's because of the Saiyan's fault. The one with long hair explains, I am Raditz. This is Nappa and Prince Vegeta. Along with you, we are the last of the Great Saiyan race. Raditz stops for a second and checks that his scouter is on. Our planet was destroyed when it collided with a giant meteor. Vegeta clenches his fist as Raditz finishes the sentence. The crowd reacts in fear, to which Nappa lifts two fingers up, blowing away the entire audience. In response, all the fighters rush to the Saiyans. Piccolo and Goku vs Raditz, while Yamcha, Ten Shin Han, and Krillin fought Nappa. Vegeta stood back and watched the battle. While the fight went down, Vegeta received a message on the scouter, and a voice telling him not to forget why he's there. Goku tried to reason with Raditz, and how if he's really his older brother, they should be working together and not against each other. This wasn't working, they would have to kill him. Kami soon arrived to witness the battle along with Chi Chi and Bulma. He asked Bulma if she had the Dragon Radar. She nodded. Kami said that they may need the Dragon Balls. We see a sweat drop fall from his forehead as he watches Goku battle. Our heroes are being beaten, but Goku manages to hold back Raditz with a full Nelson. This allows Piccolo to use the Makan Kozapu on them, which pierces through both. We see Chi Chi scream as the screen goes to white. Goku wakes up on a white void, where he hears Kami's voice echo through the entire area until he appears. He welcomes Goku and tells him that it's not his time yet, but he needs to be here until he can defeat the Saiyans. Then, we see a silhouette of a fat, short man. Meanwhile, Vegeta calls back Nappa as they need to look for the Dragon Balls. Bulma was ahead of them, however, as her, Chi Chi, and Kami all rushed in the Quinjet, which Bulma had stored in a capsule. Bulma had already three Dragon Balls, as she had been collecting them for shield. 
Vegeta rushed the other way, while Nappa pursued Bulma. Vegeta searched with the scouter, until finding a Dragon Ball underwater. Instead of going under to search, he simply evaporated the water around it with a giant blast and got the ball out. We then get a trippy scene of Goku attempting to catch a monkey. He feels as if he's been there forever, and the fat figure, who calls himself King Kai, explains that time goes by a lot slower here. Goku then asks if he's dead, and King Kai says yes with a chuckle. Goku takes a second to think before going back to rushing at the monkey. We cut back to Bulma getting blasted by Nappa as she asks Kami why they are doing this. Kami says that Goku needs to come back. Chi Chi looks sternly at him. Kami says that he will be ready once he returns. Krillin rushes back to protect the jet with Yamcha and Ten Shinhan arriving soon after. Nappa laughs at the challenge but the three fighters are ready. Krillin fires a Kamehameha at Nappa who jumps out of the way. Yamcha and Ten Shinhan come up from both sides as the smoke clears, smashing their fists against Nappa's face. The battle between the three continued in the background as Bulma localized the next Dragon Ball in London. Chi Chi, being the most normal looking, went down and looked for it. It was sitting inside a small tea shop, decorating a small Christmas tree. She quickly grabbed it and ran out, with the shop owner hat on her tail. Thankfully, she got away. Meanwhile, the Z fighters battled Nappa. The battle took them all the way to the edge of the volcano, where Nappa attempted to push face into the lava. However, he was saved just in time by Ten Shin Han blasting Nappa to the side with a Kiko Ho. As Nappa flew away, Krillin appeared on top, and slams Nappa onto the lava below. It's not shown, of course, but we get a shot of Krillin closing his eyes in disgust at the sight. With teamwork, they had defeated Nappa. Vegeta, in the other side of the world, turns back. He had just gotten the next Dragon Ball off the corpse of a short man. He realized that Nappa's power was gone. He was about to head back to the Z Fighters when Piccolo zoomed in in front. Vegeta laughed, but Piccolo simply took off his cape and regrew an arm. The battle began. I'm gonna pause this for a second just to say that I know I'm going through this somewhat fast, but that's just because the story, if it was actually filmed, would have a lot more time and things to develop. You would be able to see things happening, reactions and stuff like that. I don't have the ability to do this here, so I had to go pretty fast and just do basic points on what would happen. Of course there would be a lot more dialogue, Yamcha and Ten Shinhan would be introduced a little slower with more build-up and stuff like that. We get another scene of Goku in the Void, where King Kai explains how he must focus his key into raw power. Goku's aura bursts red as he struggles with the power and says as if his bones are being crushed. Then Goku says times two! His aura grows, but it seems as if steam comes off his body. Then times three. He can't take it. Goku falls on the ground. King Kai tells him to try again. Goku turns back to King Kai and asks what exactly he is. King Kai explains that he's the Lord of Worlds, that Goku is dead, but he's not exactly neither in heaven nor hell. He's in a special place where only the most capable heroes and fighters go to. King Kai says that Kami had a plan to save Earth. The fight between Piccolo and Vegeta takes them to Mount Poutsu. Vegeta had taken them to where the last Dragon Ball was without Piccolo realizing. Piccolo then became aware of what was happening once he sees the Z Fighters pass by, followed by Bulma's ship. Piccolo tries his best to keep Vegeta at a distance, with the Z Fighters helping out too. Their mission is to catch the bag where Vegeta is carrying the two Dragon Balls. Krillin finally does, but he is shot down by Vegeta. Piccolo catches both Krillin and the Dragon Balls and throws them both at Bulma, who was waiting outside of Goku's and Chi Chi's home. Bulma catches the Dragon Ball as Chi Chi comes out with a 4 star Dragon Ball. The Dragon Team had all the Dragon Balls. We get one final scene of Goku at King Kai's world. This time his aura is red, but he doesn't seem to be struggling with it. He is holding up a key sphere on his hand. King Kai throws a brick his way, and Goku launches the sphere at it. It explodes into bits and pushes Goku back. King Kai smiles proudly and tells Goku that he's about ready now that he has mastered the Kaioken and the Spirit Bomb. Before that, Goku turns back and asks what exactly he is. King Kai explains that he is a Saiyan, part of an extinct warrior race. He had been sent out to Earth by his parents in order to be saved from his planet's destruction. Goku asks what happened to the planet. King Kai says, Frieza. In the real world, Vegeta looks directly at a full moon as night has just struck and transforms into a giant Ozaru. He is trying to step on Bulma and kill her, but the Z Fighters manage to protect her just for long enough for her to summon the dragon. Shenron appears made out of a red substance, and Vegeta's eyes widen. This was the thing he had been looking for. Bulma quickly wishes for Goku to be brought back 
as Kami carries the body. Goku feels a pool calling onto him, and he asks if he will ever see King Kai again. King Kai smiles and tells him that he will be watching the battle and that he awaits his return. Goku nods, and the next thing he sees is Vegeta smashing Piccolo down. Ten Shinhan can barely stand up, and Yamcha's key is barely visible. Krillin is unconscious. It all seems lost, as Vegeta fires a final mouth blast at the team. Instead of the blast reaching them, we hear a scream. Kaioken times four! And the blast gets slapped away. Goku had arrived with a defiant red aura. Vegeta is perplexed at seeing Goku alive again but welcomes the challenge. A battle begins once more, sharing iconic quotes from the manga. Goku even says that he's excited to fight somebody this strong. Krillin actually helps out once he recovers. When Goku is being crushed, by waking up and using his ki Ensign to cut Vegeta's tail down. However, the battle keeps going, even after Vegeta transforms into his base form, until Goku gathers everyone's energy as the Z Fighters try their best to keep Vegeta away. The Spirit Bomb is ready, just as Piccolo is knocked out. Goku launches the Spirit Bomb, which sends Vegeta hurling high into the sky and back down to Earth, defeated. Goku falls onto the ground without any energy. However, Vegeta manages to call down his space pod. Goku approaches him slowly. Before he leaves, Vegeta asks why he doesn't just kill him, and Goku says that there's still more he wants to learn about him, and from him, about the Saiyans and who they are. He even mentions Frieza, to which Vegeta reacts in surprise. Vegeta says that they serve their destructor. Then Goku looks onto the horizon, and says that, to be honest, he is excited to maybe fight him again, but he better not show his face on Earth ever again. Vegeta calls him an idiot for letting him go, as the pod blasts off. Boma asks why he did that, as Chi Chi runs at Goku and hugs him tight. We zoom in on Goku with a sigh and a laugh before the screen fades to everyone at the hospital. Kami is visiting, congratulating them on the victory. Goku then mentions that the next tournament shouldn't be too far away, and they all chuckle. He even mentions that he'd love to have Thor enter. Boma says that Shield's gonna kill her for having lost the Dragon Balls again, but that Fury sends his regards to Goku. In fact, he was right outside, conversing with the doctor. The final shot is Piccolo right outside the window of the hospital, arms crossed, but with a smile. The credits roll, and we wait for the after credit scene. This time, we see a strange world. Nowhere, where the Collector gladly accepts a gift. He says that he couldn't believe that all seven would be in his possession, but that he will protect them with his life. The camera moves to reveal Piccolo and Kami handing over the seven Dragon Balls, and Kami says that reality itself may be in danger if they fall under the wrong hands. They then turn back and head to the Namekian ship. And so concludes the second movie of Marvel's Dragon Ball. Hey kids, don't go away. We'll be right back. And now back to our show. The inclusion of Dragon Ball changes quite a few things, such as the Winter Soldier having a specific branch of Hydra featured throughout, the Red Ribbon branch, that specializes in tech. But it all sets up Avengers Age of Ultron. We open up with all seven Avengers raiding the Hydra facility, commanded by Strucker. Alongside him is a mustached man with a tall hat. Goku's wearing a brand new Avengers uniform that allows for further flexibility and support while his body uses the Kaioken. They take down various Hydra soldiers, including plenty of robotic ones. Captain America comments on how he has come across these recently, and he feared that the red ribbon branch of Hydra is behind them. Goku's Kaioken and speed allow him to decimate a majority of enemies along with doing some good teamwork with the Hulk. They are eventually attacked by Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, two miracles that have been experimented on by Hydra. They are much more powerful than in the original story. While they retain their original powers, they also have super strength and further energy projection. Similar to Goku's, they cause some trouble for the Avengers, but Thor and Goku are able to drive them off for now. Goku takes Captain America into the base, while Stark retrieves the scepter. However, Wanda sneaks up behind Stark and makes him see a vision of all the dead Avengers. Once they return to Stark Tower, Tony, Boma, and Bruce all work together to decipher the scepter. Tony comments on how he he wishes that he could experiment on the Dragon Balls, if Bulma hadn't lost them again. Together, they discover an AI inside of the Scepter, and the three use it to create Ultron, the defense system for Earth. This version of Ultron uses Capsule Corp technology to transport the robots in an easier manner. The Avengers meet up, where Goku and the rest enjoy the party at Avengers Tower. Chi Chi is there too, showing signs of pregnancy. Goku is arm wrestling with Thor and having a grand old time. Eventually, the Avengers settle down to see who can lift Thor's hammer. The audience would be teased with an answer after Captain America, 
as Goku is the last person to try and lift it. He screams out, Kaioken times four! This causes everyone sitting down to get blown away, and the glasses shatter. Goku ends up not even trying to move the hammer, as he apologizes for causing such a ruckus. But Thor realizes that the hammer is a little closer to the edge of the table than before. Suddenly, a broken down Ultron body enters the scene. It threatens the Avengers, but Goku punches a hole through it. The Iron Legion attacks, but the Avengers keep them at bay. Even Chi-Chi helps out. Ultron retreats to the abandoned Hydra base, where the same man who was with Strucker at the beginning attempts to help him. It doesn't seem like he's doing so willingly. Ultron calls him Dr. Juro, and he tells Ultron that Vibranium is imperative to becoming a perfect being. Wanda and Pietro also join Ultron, as a Stark bomb had killed their parents. Juro calls them Experiments 17 and 18. In the background, we can see that Juro has a couple of blueprints for a project named Cell, though that's the only real cameo we get from him in the movie. The Avengers arrive at South Africa, where they try to stop the Vibranium from getting out. Wanda hypnotizes them. Goku in particular sees a vision of a man that looks very similar to him and a woman, taking him into a pod. Then a horned creature and a giant explosion. Goku is unable to battle until he breaks free. At the same time, Iron Man and Hulk have an all-out battle. Goku hears the commotion and saves as many citizens as he can, but can't do much else as the Hulk rampages. The Avengers are forced into hiding, but Goku refuses to hide with them. Instead, he begins a search for Ultron. Juro begins to create a semi-synthetic material for Ultron to be in, but it isn't advanced enough because of the lack of resources. Ultron and the others have to go to South Korea, where they can use the scepter to take control of Cho's mind, who begins to combine the stone with a more advanced synthetic body with the help of Dr. Juro. However, Wanda reads into Juro's mind and realizes his plan for the twins to be absorbed and humanity to be destroyed. The twins betray Ultron and Juro as Pietro kicks off Juro's head. Goku crashes through the wall and begins to fight against Ultron, he had already told the others where they would be able to find him, as he had found the twins through their key. Though Goku's Kaioken is clearly powerful enough to take on Ultron, Ultron releases some of the Iron Legion from the capsules. Goku then feels his life force drain away as Ultron begins to absorb his energy as he chokes him, an upgrade given to him by Jiro. The twins rescue Goku as Ultron gets away with the cradle. The other Avengers arrive at South Korea, where they help the twins and Goku steal back the cradle and head back to New York. Once at the tower, Wanda tells the Avengers that Juro had other projects in the works besides them that they should be in the lookout for, referring to Cell, who is being set up for a future film. Jarvis is uploaded into a synthetic body, which Thor brings to life. Thankfully, Vision ends up being good. Thor explains that the scepter was the Mind Stone, and is what gave Vision life. At the palm of Vision's hands are two orbs for energy absorption. The Avengers head to Sokovia, where Bruce rescues Black Widow, who had been kidnapped. The city is being lifted up to the sky, where the Avengers must stop Ultron from using it as a meteor strike. A massive battle begins, where Goku uses the Kaioken to rush through and destroy as many Ultrons as possible. All the Avengers use their signature attacks in a circle, once surrounded with Goku's Kamehameha destroying many Ultron bodies. When Quicksilver saves Hawkeye from death, the bomb Juro had implanted in him detonates. Thankfully, this saves Hawkeye and the kid he was carrying, along with destroying a swarm of Ultrons coming their way, though Hawkeye ends up being very hurt. Wanda reacts in explosive anger as the Hulk tosses Ultron from the Quinjet onto where Wanda was. She dismembers Ultron. However, the city is still coming to the ground. Goku holds up the city as much as he can before it falls, but he can't handle it for much longer. He is forced to use the Kaioken times 10, the strongest Kaioken yet, until Tony and Thor are able to make the city explode into a lake. Goku is found with his clothes burnt off and unconscious on the ground below. Vision also destroys the last Ultron drone, ending the menace. The Avengers team is fractured as they move into the new facility. Hulk is nowhere to be found. Thor is out who knows where, and Goku is getting ready for a new mission that Nick Fury had contacted him about, something about the planet of green people. The movie ends as Goku says goodbye to everyone and flies off, covered in bandages. Captain America turns to the new Avengers and says, Avengers! And that's the end of Phase 2 of What If Dragon Ball was in the MCU. We actually began Dragon Ball's part in the MCU Phase 3 with a completely different movie. Captain America Civil War. The events in this film happen similarly to how they did in reality, with a few changes. The main Avengers team actually consists of Scarlet Witch, Captain America, Falcon, Black Widow, 
Iron Man, War Machine, Ten Shanhan, and Yamcha. Ten Shanhan and Yamcha have been official members of the team following a recommendation from Goku. However, the team is broken up after the Sokovia Accords. Friends are forced to pick sides. Ten Shinhan goes with Tony, as he believes in order and security, minimizing damages and all. Ten Shinhan also wears an outfit reminiscent to his time as a crane student. This is of course an easter egg to the manga, as Ten Shinhan was a bad guy back then. Yamcha, on the other hand, joins Captain America. He is sad that he has to battle his friend, but he believes that their team should not be regulated. Yamcha was abandoned at one point, a rebel, and he didn't think the government telling heroes what to do was the right thing. He was kicked out of his baseball team because of his political stance. The airport battle is emotional between the two, as they don't want to hurt each other. Once Ant-Man turns giant, Ten Shinhan shows off his powers when he grows four arms and battles him. Though Giant Man is powerful, Ten Shinhan is also very strong. Yamcha vs T'Challa also occurs. The Wolf vs the Panther. But anyways, after this, Ten Shinhan and Yamcha never really see eye to eye, and Yamcha is put in prison along with the rest of Cap's team. I guess it's worth noting that Ant-Man and Yamcha become good friends, and that he asks for somebody to feed his cat, Puar, while he's in prison. Anyways, the main event is Dragon Ball 3, Namek. Like the other parts in the series, I did have to cut some things from the original story for the sake of the fact that this is a movie. But I did try to keep some things in. Even with those cuts, I think I ended up including maybe too much. So some of this stuff could end up in the cutting room floor, as deleted scenes. The film begins with a pre-title sequence, where a hurt Vegeta lands on a distant planet. He falls out of the ship, severely hurt, but clearly strong enough to put up a fight. He starts to move towards the building he landed in front of, but a blurry figure on a floating chair stops him. The figure says, Can you get him? Vegeta is then knocked out. That shows the title of the film. Our movie is gonna start up with Goku, Krillin, Bulma, and Chi Chi at Capsule Corp. This sequence takes place before Civil War. Nick Fury gave Goku and Bulma the task to go to planet Namek. This was under the pretense that they could maybe find the Hulk there. He did warn them that stuff has been detected around there. Bad stuff. As Goku stepped onto the ship with his team, he said goodbye to Chi Chi and his son Gohan. The door shut behind them, and all got set for their adventure. Before that, however, they notice someone else is with them. The scene is tense as they look around, and Krillin is the one that finds a white cape. He looks up and sees the nasty mug of Piccolo. Everyone is scared, but Goku approaches him as if an old friend. He says that Nick Fury asked him to join in too, and Goku is glad to have him along. They discuss a little, but it ends up with a montage of them doing activities on the ship set to a late 90s song or something. The ship they are in is actually the same one from the after credit scene of the last Dragon Ball movie, but with modifications that make it look more Capsule Corpy. Finally, the montage ends, with everyone is sleeping in their own beds, except for Goku and Piccolo, who are meditating in front of each other. They are actually having a mental battle, but it's suddenly broken off as their eyes open. They are panting, and Goku asks if he felt that too. Piccolo nods, and says that there is something big happening. The ship eventually makes port on planet Namek. This planet is green and full of flora and fauna, like the mangas. But they are also technologically advanced, and have more urban looking cities than the rural towns of Canon. The team enters the village, and Krillin asks if they had seen Bruce Banner or the Hulk. The Namekian watering his plants asks what he looks like, and Krillin tries to describe him to no avail. He finally gives up when he says, uh, he's green? They resign and say that there's no way the Hulk is here, or they would have at least heard something at this point. Just as Bulma says that, a loud boom is heard. That's probably Banner, says Goku, as the Namekians they were talking to run away, afraid. Piccolo and Goku start to sense an energy around them, and they realize there are multiple high power levels around the world. But one specific is terrifying. Goku agrees that they need to investigate, and Bulma tells them that she will go with them. Suddenly, a blast zooms past their head. A small group of soldiers led by a blue alien has begun attacking the village. Krillin grabs Bulma and they blast off with Piccolo and Goku, who blast and dodge the alien attacks behind them. This chase leads them close to a house on top of a large rock formation. 
However, Goku shot off the air and crashes onto a small village below. He goes through a house. When he gets back up, he realizes that his landing was softened by a huge Dragon Ball. His eyes widen and the blue alien lands in front. General Zarbon, the Dragon Ball! I have eyes, Kui. Hand over the Dragon Ball and the Namekians here won't be hurt. Goku doesn't know nor care what's going on and goes in for a battle against Zarbon. Piccolo stays behind with Goku to fight, while Krillin continues being chased by the soldiers. He shakes them off quickly, however he realizes that they have ended up around a large ship. The battle between Piccolo, Goku and Zarbon is intense, and Zarbon realizes that these must be the people that Vegeta fought on Earth. He laughs at them, telling them that Vegeta is already in their captivity. Goku is surprised and Piccolo is too. Find out that they could bring down such a powerful opponent. Meanwhile, back with Krillin, there are five soldiers stationed out front, doing strange poses. One of them comments on a power level being shown in their scouters. And quickly, Krillin drops to the ground and lowers his key. Boma realizes as well that the soldiers are using the scouters to locate them, that they can't sense key. The soldiers that were pursuing Krillin and Boma turn up in front of the five. They scold them for losing the pair. The soldiers resign to go out and look for them. Boma tells Krillin that they might be able to find out what's going on if they enter the ship. Krillin is reluctant, but finally agrees. They sneak in and quickly find a room with three huge Dragon Balls inside. They then hear a voice talking to somebody. He is called Lord Frieza, and he is talking to a man with a deep voice. Do not fail me again. Make sure this is the real stone. The transmission shuts off and Krillin realizes that this is the incredible power they felt earlier. They need to get out of there, quickly. Bulma turns around to walk out, but is instead met by the face of Vegeta in a healing tank. He is clearly restrained, and Bulma suggests freeing him, but Krillin says that she's crazy. Bulma tells him that he must know what's going on here, and will want to take down this Frieza guy anyways. Before Krillin can answer, Bulma clicks some buttons and frees Vegeta. Vegeta coughs as he is freed, but Bulma puts a hand over his mouth before he can speak. Vegeta blushes slightly and pushes the hand off. Krillin asks him what the hell is going on here, and Vegeta tells them that they need to get away first. As we continue to watch the fight between Zarbon and Goku, we also get a voiceover of Vegeta explaining what is happening as they run away. He tells them that he went to Earth in order to collect the Dragon Balls, as he believed they were an Infinity Stone. The Saiyans went there without telling Frieza, and were considered traitors. However, he realized this was not the case as soon as the dragon showed up. His suspicions were proven right when he was captured by Frieza, whom he heard speak to Thanos about the fact that the Dragon Balls on Earth were replicas of the ones of Namek. They were not the real stone. Although powerful, not nearly as much as the real deal. Thanos sent Frieza to Namek in order to collect the real Dragon Balls after he found out about them. Krillin, Bulma, and Vegeta finally arrive in front of Zarbon as soon as he's defeated. Piccolo attacks right away, but Krillin stops him and explains everything. A Namekian interjects, telling them that this is true. The Dragon Balls are an Infinity Stone, and they can't allow Frieza to get it. Goku tells them that they will do what they can to help, but Vegeta says that he will use them anyways, and flies off to collect the Dragon Balls. Goku asks the Namekian what they can do, and he tells them to go up to the Grand Elder's house. We transition to them entering a house where a small Namekian welcomes them. He calls himself Dende. Along with them is a fat Namekian, the Grand Elder. He pleads with them to protect Namek, and Goku agrees to. He is gifted a Dragon Ball, and the Elder explains that he created the Dragon Balls from a strange stone, and that they learned many things from his time doing so. He shows this off by giving Piccolo, Goku, and Krillin a power boost. He tells them to take Dende along with them. He will teleport them close to the Dragon Ball, but they will have to take it from there. This was one of the many things he learned since studying the stone. This isn't too far-fetched either since we have seen Kami teleport Goku to the other world and other gods teleport great distances in the manga and anime. We cut to Vegeta beating up on an Namekian as he takes their Dragon Ball. We can see that he already has two, however, he is then confronted by two of the colorful soldiers from earlier, Rikum and Goldo. We cut back and we see that the team has split up to cover more ground. Piccolo and Krillin search for the Dragon Ball together, but they are attacked by Burger and Jice. Finally, Goku, Bulma, and Dende are attacked by Captain Ginyu. They are losing at first, but then they hit their stride, and the Dragon Ball theme begins to play. Ginyu tries to switch bodies with Goku, but instead switches with Bulma. He tries again, but Goku throws a frog, and he is defeated that way. 
I should know that Ginyu and Goku has some good battle talk while doing so, just to build Ginyu's personality a bit more. Pickle and Krillin defeat Jais and Birder by working together, but Vegeta is having more trouble. Though he could probably take them individually, Goldo's time stop is a problem. He's about to get killed when suddenly Goku blasts Goldo, freeing Vegeta from the time stop. Vegeta sighs, and he is forced to work alongside Goku. The two defeat the final members of the Ginyu Force. Vegeta does note during the battle that Goku is so powerful that he might be a Super Saiyan. Then, a cackle is heard. And we realize that Frieza has caught up with them. Through the film, we have gotten glimpses of him killing Namekian warriors, taking three of the Dragon Balls he had, and characters talking about how strong he is. It's finally time to see it for ourselves. The fight starts off with Vegeta rushing in to attack him, saying that he will become immortal with the Infinity Stone. Frieza is no pushover. The horned alien does well against Vegeta. Meanwhile, Goku and the rest search everywhere for the final Dragon Ball. Goku realizes that it's back with the other Namekians. Without Vegeta knowing, Piccolo takes the Dragon Balls that Vegeta had collected. They finally find the Dragon Ball back at the village where Goku and Zarbon fought, and they make their way to Frieza's ship. They blast their way in, and the team now has all the Dragon Balls. But Frieza catches up with them once more. Vegeta is pursuing close by, and Goku is finally forced to step in. We see Frieza transform into his second state, and once again, Vegeta and Goku team up against Frieza. Through the fight, Frieza smirks as a small flashback is shown of a man very similar to Goku, but with a bandana. The man stands up to Frieza, but to no avail. Vegeta is eventually taken out of the battle with a death beam through the chest, but is not killed unlike the original manga. However, he does get his speech about how Frieza is evil. It is here revealed that Frieza was really the one to destroy planet Vegeta. When Vegeta finishes explaining this, Frieza launched a giant sphere into the core of the planet. He explains that the planet can go to hell for all he cares. All he needs is the Infinity Stone. Goku's aura explodes and a roar is heard. Frieza smiles brightly when Goku pushes himself towards him. Dende slowly starts to heal Vegeta, but Vegeta pushes him off. He admits that he can't defeat Frieza. Goku uses the Kaioken times 10, and Frieza starts to be overwhelmed. However, Frieza uses a key ball to trap Goku and blast him down to the ground. Frieza then uses this opportunity to transform him one more time into his classic final form. This power pushes everyone back. Piccolo rushes in to try to help, yelling at Goku to try and use his spirit bomb. Goku is hurt, but he raises his hands up to the sky. Everyone starts to give energy, even Vegeta. Krillin goes in to help along with Piccolo. As Goku charges the spirit bomb, we get shots of Krillin and Piccolo being hurt by Frieza. Goku closes his eyes to try and concentrate, and try to ignore the screams of his friends. It looks like the spirit bomb is ready, but just then, he opens his eyes. The spirit bomb is huge behind Frieza, but it wasn't time to celebrate. Instead, Goku saw Piccolo hurt on the floor with multiple death beam shots, and Krillin was being flown up to the sky. Bulma's eyes widen and there's a moment of silence, where the only sound is the faint scream of Krillin as he blows up. Goku's heart is heard as he lowers his hand and the spirit bomb breaks apart. The energy disappears and Goku drops to the ground. Sound comes back on to the laugh of Frieza and Bulma's cries. Vegeta grabs Dende and tells him to summon the dragon. As he does this, Goku punches the ground and a huge golden aura erupts. Frieza shoots a death beam at him but the death beam disappears as it hits Goku's aura. Lightning strikes and thunder claps. Poronga appears in the background as Goku stands up, ripping the rest of his orange top off. He looks up, his eyes a greenish color, and his hair a golden yellow. Frieza is visibly shaken by this, and Vegeta scoffs. He knew it was a Super Saiyan. Goku yells over at Boma to get themselves and everyone else out of there. Goku's fight against Frieza starts to send shockwaves throughout the world. Dende teleports everyone except for the bad guys to planet Earth, at Bulma's request. Though they realize Goku is nowhere to be found, he had refused to go. All of the Namekians thank Piccolo for his help back there, but he tells them that it's not over yet. Frieza and Goku's fight continues until the very last few seconds of Namek. Frieza is defeated by Goku using one of Krillin's best attacks the Kienzan in his honor. Frieza begs Goku for help, and Goku carries his body over to the spaceship. Goku is willing to spare Frieza's life. However, Goku can't figure out how to start the ship, and Frieza begs for some energy. He tells him that he can pilot it. Reluctantly, Goku gives him some energy. Frieza starts off the spaceship, but then a voice says, Self-destruct sequence initiated. Frieza laughs at Goku, and fires one final attack. Goku quickly turns to him, and with a heavy heart, 
kills Frieza. He doesn't have much time to escape and gets out of there as the ship collapses. Finally, we get a glimpse of a frog jumping onto one of the space spots that were around Frieza's ship. Goku looks at it and then we cut back to Earth where one of the last helicarriers arrived to pick up the Namekians. Boma had contacted Fury and he arrives. He scolds her for having made such a mess. Dende stares at Fury up and down. There's something strange about this man. Boma asks if Fury knows anything about what happened on Namek. Fury stays quiet for a second and then gives Boma a small capsule device. It had been tracking the ship Goku and the rest traveled in and there was only an error message on the screen. Boma cries. Just as Chi Chi steps out of the helicarrier holding Gohan. Chi Chi looks over at Boma and they both begin to cry. We fade out and a couple of months pass and Poronga is summoned one more time. This time to create a new planet Namek for the Namekians, to take them there and to bring back Krillin and Goku. However, Poronga explains that he can only bring back one person at a time. Regardless, Goku is alive. So as soon as Krillin flops down to Earth and is greeted by everyone, Poronga disappears along with the Namekians. The Z fighters are quiet. All they can do is wait for Goku. The credits roll and this time we actually have two after credit scenes. The first one is Krillin and Bulma hanging out with Tony after the events of Civil War, Homecoming and Namek. They are having a conversation about the events and they are introduced to Peter Parker who brings them some coffee. He asks if they should tell the government about the Dragon Balls on Namek and what they really were. Since they still thought that the Earth Dragon Balls were the stone, Tony tells them to be quiet and Bulma says that it's better to leave the Namekians alone. They don't need to bring any more humans to them. They've brought enough destruction. Then, one more scene plays. Goku is sleeping quietly in the pod. The frog jumps onto his lap. We then get an outside shot of the pod, and a flash of light comes from inside. A laugh is heard. Hey kids, don't go away. We'll be right back. And now back to our show. Avengers Infinity War then begins. Of course, some other movies and events happen in between that we don't get to see here. There are a few things that change, but most importantly is the fact that at the start of Infinity War, it's not only Thanos and the Black Hand attacking the Asgardians, but also Goku. Why Goku? Why are you attacking my people? <laughs> Shut up, you fool! He pleads with him to stop, but he won't listen. However, the frog that was in the pod with Goku jumps over to Thor who holds him protectively. When Heimdall sends Hulk to Earth, the frog hops onto the teleportation beam, landing on Earth with Banner. The frog stays close to Banner for the rest of the sequence, and Doctor Strange realizes something is up. He doesn't say anything, but we are told so through him staring at the frog curiously. When the Black Order arrives on Earth, Goku is there along with them. Iron Man fights Goku, trying to get him to calm down. However, Goku says that Tony is doomed. To his own surprise, Goku is seemingly having trouble with his own power and starts to be overwhelmed by Tony. Then we realize what's happening as Goku screams, Change! No! towards Tony. It was Ginyu in Goku's body all along and he is trying to switch bodies with Tony. However, Doctor Strange realizes this just in time. He yells at Banner to throw the frog who was on his shoulder, just as he created a portal in front of Ginyu's attack, and out to the frog. The beam hits the frog and Goku is back in his body. The big brute of the Black Order is about to attack Strange, but he teleports both the monster and the Ginyu frog out of the battle. Tony is about to attack Goku again, but Strange stops him and Goku explains what just happened. Goku is hurt after the battle, but is still willing to fight. The rest of the movie is pretty similar to the original. However, Captain America is joined by Yamcha and Krillin in Wakanda. During the battle, Ten Shenhan arrives to help. Yamcha and Ten Shenhan have an emotional reunion where they use their respective attacks and fight in unison. Bulma tries to call Tony, but nothing is working. We see that Vegeta is with her, gearing up and telling her that it will be okay. Bulma takes off to meet with Chi Chi while Vegeta calls down his pod and follows Thanos' ship where he finds Goku, Iron Man, Spider Man, and Doctor Strange. Spider Man is ecstatic to meet Goku. Not only did he know him as a great hero, but he has also been taking care of Gohan for some money during the summer. Chi Chi now lives close to New York, as she hoped that Gohan would get a better schooling there. Tony has been helping her with some of the stuff around there. Gohan is now around 4 years old, give or take, but the timeline of the MCU is kind of weird at times. On Earth, the Z Fighters actually feel Goku's energy arrive on Earth. 
This alerts them to everything that's going on. Pekul, in particular, goes up to the lookout to talk to Kami about a chamber. But he's not in much of the film. Another change comes in Thanos going to nowhere. And Namek. He goes to nowhere to destroy the Earth's Dragon Balls, so they can't be used against him. And he goes to Namek to get the Dragon Balls from there. His forces spread out quickly to find them, killing many, many Namekians in the process. Once Thanos gets the Dragon Balls, he crushes them one by one. They turn into red dust that combine into the Reality Stone. When they get to Titan and meet with the Guardians, Tony comments on how dumb they are, and how they remind him of Goku. The battle against Thanos there is a little more in their favor, with a portion where Goku and Vegeta alone face the Mad Titan. I was saving this for you, Kakarot, but it looks like we have no choice. Heh, <laughs> glad to see you weren't slacking off while I was gone, Vegeta. Regardless of hair color, you are no match. Let's go, Vegeta! He comments on how crazy it is that these are the Saiyans that defeated Frieza. Goku is unable to keep Super Saiyan for long, since he's not used to it. He's been in a pod for months and hasn't been able to train, but he uses it to actually pull the gauntlet off of Thanos' hand. This gives everyone a second of relief. Sadly, Thanos had grabbed the Reality Stone a mere second before Goku removed the gauntlet. He used this to turn Goku into a small monkey. Goku would remain that way until Thanos leaves for Earth. In the end, Doctor Strange still needs to give him the stone. When Thanos finally snaps, Tenshin Han, Dende, and Bulma disappear from the dragon team. In Titan, Vegeta feels what's happening. He feels himself wasting away. He doesn't know what to do, but he knows he can at least save one thing. He pushes Goku onto the Saiyan pod he arrived in. Goku tries to fight against going. He wanted to stay with Tony and the others, but the pod blasted off as Vegeta disappeared. The pod lands on Earth not long after, a lot sooner than Nebula and Tony. This sets up Avengers Endgame. In Endgame, we see Goku away from all the other Avengers. He's actually at Kami's lookout, along with Piccolo. He's talking to somebody shorter than him, and the camera pans down to reveal an 11-year-old Gohan. Meanwhile, with the Avengers, Yamcha and Krillin have become official parts of the Avengers team. They, along with everybody else, go out looking for Clint Barton. They find his presence using key, but they know that they aren't the right people to talk to him. So they just tell Natasha where he's at. Yamcha has been doing a lot of charity work using his baseball fame to do so. During the past sequence where they go out to kill Thanos, Goku is inside the ship with everyone else. He doesn't know how he feels about Captain Marvel, but she doesn't like him very much. Back in her time, Saiyans were a trouble bunch through the galaxy. We even get some references of them in Captain Marvel. During the sequence, Goku's still all patched up, following the battle against Thanos. Goku senses Thanos' key to find where he's at, in the planet. He remains in the background for most of it, clenching his fist at the Mad Titan. Thor is still the one who kills him. But anyways, back in the present, there has only been five years since Infinity War. Goku and Piccolo spent a few days in the hyperbolic time chamber training Gohan. This aged him up a little bit more than he should have. Though he can't spend much time there, since he just can't take the training. We see them go down to the city to Chi Chi, who looks a lot older than she actually is, because of the stress. They have a shrine up for Bulma and the others. Gohan always remembers Peter fondly, since he took care of him. He even has a Spider-Man wristwatch. There is a knock on the door. It's Krillin, Hulk, and Thor. They ask Goku for his help, as they are bringing the Avengers back together. Goku has only occasionally been with them, since the killing of Thanos. He mostly spends time at the lookout now. However, Krillin and the others had an emotional reunion when he landed on Earth. They all came and visited at the hospital. Gohan wants to come along and help out. He knows he's strong. He is willing to fight alongside his father for Peter and the others. But neither his mom nor his dad will let him. Goku joins in with the rest of the Avengers to travel back in time. Goku, Thor, Krillin and Rocket Raccoon end up on Namek, sometime before the arrival of Frieza. They collect all the Dragon Balls, but the Namekians don't want to give them up. That is, until the Grand Elder steps in and tells the others that he feels the universe telling him that this is for justice. He also tells them to take care of the child of Katat, a reference to Piccolo's origin. Which reminds me, Piccolo went with Hulk to get the Time Stone. They both get their soul taken out of their bodies. Surprisingly, Piccolo's soul looks like Kami. Anyways, Goku's theme gets attacked by a recon group made up of Birder and Jice but they are able to defeat them with some great teamwork. Thor and Goku in particular have gotten very used to their fighting styles, even though Goku is having a little more trouble with this chubbier Thor. Since Thor 2 happened differently, they don't have a reason to go to Asgard. However, Thor asks the Grand Elder for his help, 
He wants to see Asgard one last time. The Grand Elder is a mysterious figure with plenty of powers, coming from his research in the Reality Stone. And, as he did this before, he can teleport people. He teleports Thor and the others to Asgard. There, Thor introduces Goku and Krillin to his mom. Rocket is out, doing whatever. You know how he is. She recognizes that Goku and him seem to have things in common, and they all acknowledge that they are good friends. He also obtains Mjolnir. When the Avengers return to the present, Yamcha is there waiting. However, there is something off-putting about things to the Z-Fighters, who feel a strange presence. This is of course the evil Nebula, but they can't pinpoint it. All the Avengers are saddened by the death of Black Widow, but there is no time to waste. Both Thor and Goku offered to snap, but Tony argues that Goku's kinda dumb, and will end up bringing back people in danger. Hulk is the one that must do it, and he successfully brings back people safely. We get a short scene of Bulma returning to Chi Chi's place, and the two hug. However, not all is well, as the Avengers building is destroyed by Thanos and his forces. There are two ships, Thanos' and Frieza's. Since this is past Thanos, this is also past Frieza. And their whole armies are here. Out of the destroyed building, Thor, Iron Man, and Captain America come out. Goku is nowhere to be found. The fight happens as normal, and the other Avengers get the help of Krillin and Yamcha. Their powers allow them to destroy the debris around them and get out of there quickly. Piccolo helps as well. They are all worried about Goku. However, the ground begins to shake, and a golden aura erupts from below. Goku rises out of the ground as a Super Saiyan, and he goes in for an attack. Goku keeps Thanos busy, and Thanos is losing to Goku. That is until Thanos commands his army to shoot a beam down to Goku. This makes Goku go fly off and break his arm. Thanos turns back and slams Thor onto the ground, ready to kill him. However, he is then hit in the head by Mjolnir. Captain America was proven worthy. He threw the hammer again, and this time Goku caught it from the other side, slamming it against Thanos' face. Goku was worthy too. However, he didn't need the hammer. Captain America caught it again, but this didn't last for long, and Captain eventually lets go of it, and starts to be pushed back. That's when Thanos calls down his forces. Frieza comes out with the Ginyu Force and hundreds of other soldiers. He is already in his final form, and the Black Order is there too. Captain America stands tall, with Goku and Thor behind him. It seems lost. Just then, portals begin to open up behind them. The first one to come out is a flying flash of light. Vegeta. Slowly, the others show up. Tension Hunt, Spider-Man, Pepper, Chi-Chi, and even Gohan. They all arrive from portals to help. Chi-Chi and Gohan turn to Goku and hug him. Chi-Chi glares at Thanos, ready to fight. Gohan clicks his Spider-Man wristwatch, and his suit becomes a superhero's. This is very clearly a reference to the great Saiyamans, but more in the style of Iron Man. Tony and Boma had worked on it together prior to Infinity War. They were gonna give it to him when he was older, but now it was the time. All of the heroes are there and they stare down at Thanos and his forces. Avengers! The team runs in, and Goku instantly rushes towards Frieza in his hover chair. Their fight is just as intense as last time, but Frieza is clearly losing. Gohan and Chi-Chi stayed on the ground, fighting Thanos' forces and Frieza's soldiers. Vegeta tried his hand at Thanos alongside War Machine, while Piccolo flew alongside Falcon, defeating the monsters. Yamcha teamed up with T'Challa, both using their wolf and panther styles respectively. Ten Shin Han reunites with everyone and uses his tri-beam to take out large chunks of soldiers. Goku is eventually thrown down to Earth, and surrounded by the past Ginyu Force, Miner's Burger and Jice. So Vegeta and Captain Marvel battle Frieza instead. Captain Marvel comments on how she always wanted to punch Frieza's ugly muck. He also appeared in Captain Marvel as a small cameo. Vegeta smirks at her. Gohan also gets to fight alongside Spider-Man, where Peter is surprised to see how much Gohan has grown. The two make a great team together. There are many moments like that, including one where Goku uses the broken pole of a ship as a power pole alongside with Krillin, to defeat two of the Black Order members. There is a sequence where Frieza tries to destroy the whole planet like Namek, but this time all the Z-Fighters, as well as Captain Marvel, Thor, and Iron Man, push the giant sphere away, which destroys Frieza and his own ship. After Captain Marvel gets punched away by Thanos, Goku gets another chance to battle, but this time, Thanos with the Power Stone. Goku can keep up a little bit, but not for long. He is eventually punched away too. The climax is the same as the original, with Tony sacrificing himself as the villains disappear. Goku, Gohan, and Chi-Chi land to be by Tony's side, but they stand there quietly. The funeral includes the Z-Fighters, with Piccolo standing over the house. All the Avengers get their own conclusions, and Goku's no different. 
He takes this chance to catch up with his family and train Gohan. He has his sights on the next martial arts tournament, as he heard somebody named Mr. Satan is there and will be very strong. The last we see of him, he says goodbye to Thor, as he goes with the Guardians of the Galaxy and Goku to the lookout with Piccolo. Of course, the story is not over yet, but that's all I can cover for now. Maybe a new Dragon Ball show is announced for Disney Plus? Krillin and Tenshinhan, the Wolfang Fist, Piccolo and War Machine? Anything is possible. All I know is that Phase 4 will include Dragon Ball 4, the Cell Games. I hope you enjoyed this three-part series with more to come when Phase 4 begins. Thanks so much for watching, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. I will now be featuring some comments that answer the Dragon Ball question of the week, so shout out to these fellas. The Dragon Ball question of the week this week is, who do you think should play Goku in a live action film? Leave your comments down below, make sure to tag it with hashtag DBQ, and you may appear in the next one. Anyways, until we meet again, see ya! Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to Smugstick, unless you want to be destroyed. Lord Beerus, that's hardly fair. But also, don't forget to click the bell icon to get notified when he uploads new videos.